but uh, spent uh, one year uh, among us, so uh, uh, you are partially spent. <laughs> okay. Yes, I have uh, So uh, the title is Geometric Aspects of Compact Sets and Compact Convex Sets in Asymmetric Non-Test Spaces. Right. Thank you, Juan, and thank you, Lola and Javier, for inviting me to this seminar. Uh, as Matthias, I am. Um, I don't work in optimizations. I am more a topologist. But I today I'm going to talk about something that is general. So I hope, and it's about convex sets. And at least my results are in R N. So maybe <laughs> it's not um, far away from you. So. Um, I will start by a little introduction to um, quasi-metric and asymmetric norms. And then I will talk about compact sets and compact and convex sets in these kind of spaces. So, um, as you all know, the well-known definition of a metric space is a pair xd, where x is a set and d is a function from x times x into the non-negative numbers that satisfies three conditions. The first condition is the triangle inequality. Uh, the second condition is the so-called identity of indiscernibles, meaning that d of x, y is equal to zero if and only if x is equal to y, and the symmetry. So, when I learned this in the university, the professor told me, oh, of course, that a distance must be symmetric because it's always the same going from a to b than from b to a. Oh. So, this is a, a map of my neighborhood in Mexico City. This red point is my house, your house. And this pink point is the closest gas station. Each time that I need gasoline, I have to drive three kilometers. But from the gas station to my house, I need to drive around three, 10 kilometers, more than three times the, the distance. So, after this example, I think that the action of symmetry, I can delete it. And what I get, of course, is not a metric space, it's a, another structure called a quasi-metric space. So, a quasi-metric space is like a metric space, but without the action of symmetry. This is nothing new, the first person introducing this notion was an American mathematician named Wallace Alvin Wilson in 31. Um, well, there are some applications about these spaces. However, um, I have the, the quasi-metric space and look at this if and only if. Is that really necessary? Of course it's necessary, but uh, there are situations when this not happens. For example, consider the line of time. The point A is the moment I get my PhD. And the, mom the point B is the moment I will get a tenure position. Of course, <coughs> from A to B is positive. But if I get a tenure position, I already have a PhD. So that distance is zero. Okay, maybe this is a rhetorical example, but there are other mathematical examples. For example, um, consider a metric space and uh, consider A and B non empty subsets of X and define the excess function, the excess of A over B, as the supremum of all distances between points A in capital A to the set B. You take the supremum of all such distances, and that is the excess of A over B, meaning um, how much I have to enlarge the set B to cover A. So this function satisfies these three conditions. It's always equal or greater than zero. Uh, it satisfies the, the um, triangle inequality. And for example, if A and B are closed sets, then the excess of A over B is zero if and only if A is contained in B. 
but not the inverse. So it's not a symmetric function. Um, so after these two examples, it's interesting to ask us what happens if we remove the if and only if, and we keep only these implications. So if we do that, what we get is a so-called quasi-pseudometric space. Uh, quasi-pseudometric space is a pair xd where x is a set and d is a so-called quasi-pseudometric, meaning that d is a function from x times x into the non-negative numbers satisfying the triangle inequality and these implications. If x is equal to y, then the distance between x, well, the d of x, y is equal to zero. So, surprisingly, uh, at least for me, quasi pseudometrics have many, many applications. Uh, most of them are in computer science, but I find one in, in genetics, so uh, they are interesting. And because of that, some people call this quasi pseudometric just quasi metric. So, so in some papers I read quasi metric meaning this. So, an asymmetric spa normed space is the normed version of this kind of spaces. So, let me uh, define. Suppose that X is a real vector space. I will say that an, a function Q from X into the non negative numbers is an asymmetric norm or a quasi norm if it satisfies the triangle inequality, if Q of lambda x is equal to lambda of Qx only for non-negative lambda, and if Q of x is equal to zero and that is equal to Q of minus x, that, only, uh, is, that happens if and only if x is equal to zero. So, in this case, the pair xq is an in asymmetric normed space and the function q is a quasi norm or a asymmetric norm. So a simple example, for example consider the map u from r into the non-negative number uh, defined as the maximum between x and zero, x plus. So this is a, the most basic example of an asymmetric norm. Uh, in R2, we can do the same. Um, uh, we can define Q of the point x, y as the maximum of x plus and y plus. This is another example of an asymmetric normed space. And in general, we can do uh, this, this, we can define uh, an asymmetric norm in a Banach lattice if we well, suppose that x is a Banach lattice and define q of x as the, suprem at the, as the norm of the supremum between x and the origin. This is another example of an asymmetric uh, space. In this case, uh, people call it a, an asymmetric lattice norm and the space is an asymmetric normed lattice. So, uh, uh, last example. Uh, this is not an asymmetric uh, lattice, uh, an asymmetric lattice norm space, but is um, oh, consider the space C0 of 0, 1 that is the set of all continuous functions from 0, 1 into the reals such that the integral is 0. In this case, we can define an asymmetric norm by taking the maximum of the values of f in the interval 0, 1. So this is another example that has many, many strange uh, properties. I will talk one of these properties later. So, each time that we have an, an asymmetric um, normed space, we can define another norm, an associated norm to this space, by taking um, this, this, uh, this function, q bar, where q bar of x is q of minus x. In this case, uh, well, this is a, an, another asymmetric norm, and we can define also a symmetric norm. I mean, a, a norm in the usual sense. But this norm is going to be denoted by Qs, and is the maximum of Qx and Q bar of x, which is the maximum of Qx and Q of minus x. So, 
for example, in, in the case of RU, um, U bar is the maximum between 0 and minus x, and US is the absolute value of x. So is the usual norm in, in R. So each time that we have an asymmetric uh, normed space, we can define a topology. So this topology is generated by the balls, the um, open balls, the, uh, <coughs> the open balls, define it as the open ball of radius epsilon around x will be the set of all points y in x such that q of y minus x is less than epsilon. And here the order is important. And so if we take all possible balls over all possible epsilon, over all possible x, we have a basis of a unique topology that I will denote by tau, tau q. And Sorry, what is uh, t0? What was? What was? T0. T0? Ah, t okay. It's, always, it's the action. T0 means that. Okay, again. I have a topology. This topology, I, I will explain this now, is always T0, but in general is not Hausdorff. So T0 means that if you have two points, there is an open set containing one but not the other. Yes. Only that. The other. Yes, it could be one this or, or, or it could be the other. Yes, I, I don't know which one of them. Yes, for example, here, here in, 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 in RU, one and two, I can find an open set containing one and not two. But each time that I have an open set containing two, it will always contain this, the point one. So I, I cannot decide which one of them. So this is an example of a non hausdorff topology. Um, in RU, the basic open sets are the intervals minus infinity A. And this is why some people call this topology the topology of the upper semi-continuity. Because a function from a topological space into RU will be continuous if and only if it's upper semi-continuous. Um, um, the symmetric topology, the, symmet the topology generated by the norm QS is very helpful um, and I will denote this topology by tau of QS and I will call the symmetric topology. So um, it's uh, not difficult to see that the asymmetric topology is always contained in the symmetric topology and um, since I uh, is I'm going to be playing with both topologies. I need to, in some cases, I need to make difference. So I will say that a set is Q open or Q closed or Q compact or a map is Q continuous. If it's open, closed, compact, continuous with respect to the asymmetric topology. And the same for the symmetric topology, the, symmetric, the topology generated by QS. So this is just notation. And as I said, if we remove the symmetry, the mathematical world, as we know, collapses. So things like, for example, the map that sends x to minus x is not continuous in general. Um, an example of this is in this space C0 of 0, 1 that I uh, introduced a few slides above. Here consider the function the constant function zero and the um, sequence of functions fn defined by this graph f in zero is equal to minus one, one plus one over n f of one over n is equal to zero and f of one is one over n so the maximum of the values is one over n so q of fn tends to zero as n tends to infinity but if we multiply by minus, minus 1, then Q of minus Fn will be minus 1 over n plus 1, which is equal to n minus 1 over n, and that tends to 1 as n tends to infinity. So um, because of these two sequences, we can 
prove that this map uh, is not continuous. So, every asymmetric uh, normal space is locally convex in the sense that each point has a local basis of convex sets. Um, is, it can be proved that the addition of two vectors is a continuous map, but the scalar multiplication may not be continuous, and the map that sends x to minus x may not be continuous. So, because of these two reasons, the number three and four, in general, asymmetric normal spaces are not topological vector spaces. So all we know about topological vector spaces, we cannot use it here. Oh, we have to use it, but very carefully. And also, because the, these, they are not even topological groups. So it is a, it's a new structure. Um, it was proved, uh, I, I don't put the year here, but it was 2000 something, it's, it's recently this work. Um, if a space is T1, T1 means that given two points, you can find a neighborhood containing one, another neighborhood containing the other, and um, this point is not in this neighborhood, and this point is not in this neighborhood. But the neighborhood may have not empty, may have no, non-empty intersection. So they, he proved that if the space is T1 and has algebraic finite dimension, then there exists a norm, a symmetric norm that generate the asymmetric topology. So in this case, what we have is the Euclidean, the Euclidean topology. Uh, if the space satisfies the, the axiom T1. So it's interesting to know when a uh, an asymmetric normed space is not T1. And for that, uh, let me define the set theta zero, which consists of all points such that q of x is equal to zero. Um, for example, here in, in, in RQ, all this is theta of zero. Yeah. Um, it's always a convex cone, and it can be proved that it's closed in the symmetric topology. Oh, the example. And theta zero satisfies some properties that are very useful. The first one is that if theta zero is equal to the singleton zero, then the space is T1. And if a set U is open, then U is equal to U plus theta zero. So we are always carrying on the, the set theta zero in, in open sets. A set K is Q compact if and only if K plus theta zero is, comp is Q compact. And if K is Q compact, then K plus theta zero is Q is closed, closed in the symmetric topology. Uh, the problem with compact sets is that in general they are not closed. For example, in, in RU, if you consider any point x, then the point is U compact, of course, every point is compact everywhere. <coughs> However, the closure of x coincides with the interval, the closed interval x infinity, which is far from being the singlet. So the points are not closed. However, in RU, <coughs> There is a simple way to characterize compact sets. A set will be compact if and only if the supremum of k is finite and belongs to k. Why? Because each set containing this point will contain the whole interval minus infinity supremum of k and then it will contain the set k. So all, all sets are like this. Um, so this, uh, the ex what happens here in, in R is interesting because this says that every compact say, set have a point or a subset 
that if this subset is in K and K is contained in this subset plus theta zero, that is the whole interval, then the set is Q compact. So we can generalize this, this notion. So in order to do that, first observe that is a set if a set is compact in the symmetric topology, then it's compact in the asymmetric topology. So, I will say that a set is strongly compact if and only if there exists a QS compact set, I mean a compact set in the symmetric topology, such that K0 is contained in K and K is contained in K0 plus theta0. So it's not difficult to see that every Q strongly compact set is also Q compact, but the inverse is, is not always true. So it's an open problem to characterize all the Q strongly compact sets in an asymmetric normed space. However, there are, it's, it's not solved, but there are some results about. For example, um, Konradi Amabula to South Africans prove that if in Rn you define the asymmetric norm P, where P of x1, x2, xn is the maximum of x1 plus, x2 plus, xn plus, is like the generalization of this, then each P compact set, which is also closed in the symmetric topology, is going to be strongly compact. And this can be generalized if we replace the norm P by any other asymmetric lattice norm in Rn. Uh, all our uh, asymmetric lattice norm induced by the natural coordinate ways order in Rn. Uh, however, in infinite dimension, this not happens anymore. Um, for example, Consider this, the space L1, Q, L1 is L1, and Q is the asymmetric norm defined by this formula. Q of uh, this point is going to be the sum over AI plus for all I in, 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 in N. And the set K will be the set of all points XN such that X0 is the origin x1 is 1 minus 1, 0, 0, 0, x2 is 1 over 2, 0 minus 1, 0, 0, 0, and xn will be 1 over 2 to the n minus 1, n minus 1, zeros minus 1, 0, 0, 0. So it's, it's not difficult to see that this space is um, Q compact with this topology. And is QS closed. In fact, it's a discrete set, but it's not a strongly compact. It's just an example. So, what we do, when I say we, I mean me and Enrique Sanchez from Universidad Politécnica of Valencia, is to see if we can say, if we can not generalize, but um, to characterize compactness in convex sets. Th this is what we try to do. So we start by something more simple. Uh, we try to, gener to characterize the geometric structure of finite dimensional compact convex sets. So in RU, is, there is nothing to do. It's very obvious that every um, Compact convex set is strongly compact and in fact is of the form a closed interval AB or an open closed interval AB or an closed ray minus infinity B. We prove that in R2 every Q compact convex set is strongly compact, but we prove a little bit more. We prove that if we have in R2, sorry, uh, R2 we provided with an asymmetric lattice norm. So we prove that if we have a 
Q-compact convex set in R2, there exist two points, AV and UV, where U is the supremum of the projections in the first coordinate, V is the supremum of the projections in the second coordinate, the point A is the supremum of the projections of the points of the form XV in the first coordinate, and the point B is the supremum of the projections in the second coordinates of the points of the form UY. So there exist these two points belonging to the, the set, and all points in the border of the sets between AV and UB also belong to the, to the set. What happens in the border here, we don't care. So all these points exist in the, in the set, and also the intersection of the upper plane determined by these two points with the set is completely contained in the set and is compact in the symmetric topology. And the set it will be contained in the sum of this compact set with theta zero. That is something like that. And we'll, if we take any convex set containing this set and contain it in this big one set, is going to be um, a Q compact convex set. So it's a kind of characterization of compact convex sets in R2. However, if we try to do this in higher dimensions, that's not possible. Uh, there are examples of, in a three-dimensional space, that uh, compact convex sets must not be strongly compact. Uh, the example, in fact, is very silly. Um, consider in R3 the asymmetric lattice norm defined by Q of x1, x2, x3 as the maximum of x1 plus, x2 plus, x3 plus. And there, consider the set K, which will be the convex hull of the set A, where A is this part, is the, the set of all points x1, x2, 0, such that x1 square plus x2 square is equal to 1, and x1, x2 <coughs> are both equal or greater than 0. So we take the convex school of this, the points, the origin, and the point 1, 0, 1. And then we remove this point. So if we remove this point, each time that we consider an open set containing this point, this set is like an infinite open box, will contain this point. So every open cover by Q open sets will contain the symmetric closure of the, of the set K, and the symmetric closure is compact. So this set is compact, but it's not a strongly compact, because if there exists um, a, as a symmetric compact set here, such that the set K is contained in that compact set plus theta zero, it must contain this point and all these points. Oh, but if it's also compact in the symmetric topology, then it also has to contain this point, and that's not possible because I removed that point. Oh. So this is an example of a um, Q compact convex set which is not a strongly compact. However, we decide to approach the problem in a different way. So, I don't need to recall Kramer-Milman theorem because Matthias already do for me. But just let me point out that from Kramer-Milman no? from Kramer-Milman theorem, um, I can say that each compact convex set has at least one extreme point. And let me recall that in the case of finite dimensional Banach spaces, the Crane Milman theorem is stated differently. Um, each compact convex set is the convex hull of its extreme points. We don't need to take the closure. So that's important. Uh, the definition of extreme point that I don't need anymore. So in 2004, COPS has proof that if the asymmetric normed space satisfies the 
the axiom of Hausdorff-Ness, then it satisfies the Crane-Milman theorem, just as Crane-Milman stated. But we need the space to be Hausdorff. So what happens if we take out the, the, the axiom of Tidos? So what we prove is the following. We prove that if we have a Q-compact convex set in an asymmetric normed space, such that k plus theta zero is QS locally compact, meaning that is locally compact in the symmetric topology, then it has at least one extreme point. Um, this is, uh, in, uh, as a particular case, if k plus theta zero has finite dimension, then it has at least one extreme point. And this is the most I can say, because there are examples, for example, if you consider any point plus theta zero, then this is going to be a Q-compact convex set with a unique extreme point, the point X. Um, so this is uh, the most we can say about existence of extreme points. But we also prove a sort of characterization, it's, it's not exactly a characterization, but it's, I, I think it's, it's a very nice result. We prove that if we have a convex set K in X, and we denote by SK the convex school of all the extreme points of X, then if K plus theta zero has finite dimension, in particular if we are in Rn, then the convex school of the extreme points of k will be contained in k, of course, and k will be contained in the convex school of the extreme points of k plus theta zero, which will be equal to k plus theta zero. So this is like um, the notion of strongly compactness, but different, because the set S of k may not be compact in the symmetric topology. However, what is interesting is that if you have a Q-compact convex set in a, a symmetric normed space such that k plus theta zero has finite dimension, just like here, then any other set contained between the convex school of the extreme points of k and the convex school of the extreme points of k plus theta zero will be compact in the asymmetric topology. So somehow this characterizes the, the compact convex sets in asymmetric normed space with finite dimension, with finite dimension. And however, we don't know everything. For example, we don't know if in general each compact convex set has an extreme point. And we don't know if, if there exists a way to characterize all compact convex sets in, in asymmetric normed space. So with this I finish and some reference and thank you very much.